2 Corinthians 11. Second Corinthians eleven. And let's read now, let's read through verse fifteen. And then, uh, and then we'll we'll get to the the rest of the chapter there in a little bit. So, um, of course, we were here Sunday morning, and of course, really what we we talked we just zeroed in on the simplicity that's in Christ on Sunday morning. Let's begin again at verse one. It says, "Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband." that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through a subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. For I suppose I was not a wit behind the very chiefest of the apostles. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge. But we have been truly made manifest among you in all things. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted? Because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely. I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, it means when he lacked, I was chargeable to no man, for that which was lacking to me the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion. For wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. He starts off in verse 1, and he says, uh, you know, bear with me. And, and he actually says it twice in the first verse. In other words, uh, and when you get reading this chapter, you know, it really makes sense. And he, he says it again later in the chapter in another way. He's saying, uh, you know, normally I wouldn't do this. You know, this really is an, an unusual chapter. Uh, Paul is writing, and, and really he's, he starts telling them all that he had done, all that he had done on their behalf, all that he had suffered. And, um, and Paul says, you know, bear with me. He says, normally I wouldn't do this. Um, but, he, but he said, you know, you know, the Holy Ghost obviously had prompted him to go ahead and do this. Um, in this chapter, again, you see the comparison. Paul keeps contrasting himself versus whoever these other folks were. Uh, we talked about it in chapter 10. We talked about that group that was causing the undercurrent in Corinth. And Paul, in chapter 11, is again addressing that. Um, you know, um, verse 2, he says, for I. Verse 3, but I fear... And then verse 4, he says, for if he that cometh. And he goes to the end of the verse and he says, you might well bear with him. Look at verse 12. He says, but what I do, 
that I will that I will do that I may cut off occasion from them. And he keeps drawing this contrast between I and them. I and he. You know, he's he's drawing this this thing that's going on here. Um, Paul says in these verses, um, he says, bear with me. He says, as I tell you what I'm going to tell you. And then he says in verse 4, he says, if some dude comes in and preaches something totally wrong, look at the end of the verse. You might well bear with him. He says, you're going you're gonna to put up with this, this stranger that's getting ready to wreck your Christianity and take you down the wrong road. He says, you seem very willing to bear with them. He said, so since we're, you forced me into this position, he says, I want you to humor me for a few minutes. Why I talk to you about why what I have to say is so much superior to what they have to say and what the, the influence you're allowing them to have. Verses 5 through 12, Paul says, For I suppose I was not a whit, not even a teeny bit, behind the very chiefest apostles. Now it's funny because in all the other passages where Paul refers to himself, he always talks about him as being the least of the saints and, and the least of the apostles and the one born out of due time and less than the least. But here, and the Holy Ghost is stamping his approval, Paul says, in reality, he says, I'm not a bit behind even the chiefest of the apostles, whoever that be. Um, you know, uh, uh, the scripture talks in another place about the stars. And it says, and yet one star differeth from another in glory. And Paul says, I am not a whit behind the chiefest of the apostles. Verse 10 he talks about his boasting. He said, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. And of course there he's talking about his financial sacrifice, his personal sacrifice to help the Corinthians. And uh, there again, if Paul wasn't saying that he never took money from churches because right there in verse 8 he says, I did take money from other churches. And he said to the Corinthians, he says, I did it to help you. We don't know what his motivation was, um, um, but he must have sensed something about the Corinthians that he didn't ever want them to be able to look at him and accuse him of taking advantage of them or of using them for financial gain. Paul, you know, I don't know if, if God had put something in his heart, if God had put a restraint or a warning in him that one day he would have to defend himself to them. And in verse 12, he says, he says, what I do, he says, I have done it to cut off occasions. He said, there, there are some people in your, in your assembly there, and he says, they've been looking for anything to wreck my influence. And he said, what I have done he said, I did, you know, it's like the Lord told the disciples, be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. And, and you know, it, it, no doubt it was wisdom from the Holy Ghost and the Lord had, had put him in a place where the Lord said, now Paul, he says, you know, someday, it's like a preacher told me once, you know, there's, 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 there's wisdom, there's, and you know, sometimes it's worldly wisdom, but, but there, is, there is wisdom years, many, many years ago. A pastor told me something I never forgot. And um, um, he, um, he was talking about handling things through emails. And you know, you get somebody and they write you a nasty email and then you respond and all that stuff. And of course now it's extended to social media and all that stuff. And, um, and he, he told me, he said, Brother Joe, he said, don't ever put anything in writing. He said, if somebody sends you an email and it's a hot one and, and you're, you feel like you need to defend yourself, he said, don't ever respond with an email, ever. And then he said this. He said, because anything you put in writing can 
and will be used against you. He said it'll get quoted, it'll get circulated, and of course they'll take it out of context. Well, you know, Paul is, is sort of uh, referring to something like that here. As Paul says, I've been very careful to not give my enemies occasion to, uh, to say anything to, to hurt my influence there. Um, look at verse 13. He says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And of course he said, you know, and then in the next two verses he just comes right out with it and he said, whoever these guys are, he said they are satanic. He said, uh, you know, they're, they're not just deceived brethren. They're not just carnal brethren. He said they are satanic. He said they are Satan's ministers. He said these, these other men um, he said they, they look like the ministers of righteousness, but he said, but they're a different type of men altogether. He said they're a different breed. He said they are not men of God. And, and really, this whole chapter is about a vendetta. Uh, uh, um, there was a campaign. There was a very deliberate attack against Paul himself. And, of course, we understand that. You know, we understand that Paul wrote, you know, a big wad of our New Testament. And Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. And Paul was a key player in, you know, New Testament Christianity. And, um, and in Corinth, there was a little group of people. We don't know how many. But there was an aggressive attempt to undermine Paul's influence. Paul had great influence. He had great influence in Corinth due to his labor, uh, due to the power of God. There was no question that God had brought him in there. God had used him. God had raised him up. Uh, there was no question that, that the hand of God, there was a whole church sitting there and a whole bunch of people that were converted and helped and their lives had been changed and the reason was Paul. And so there was a fairly loyal group of people loyal to Paul. But there was this, this other group in there, and they absolutely wanted to turn the people against Paul. They wanted to cut off his influence. Uh, these troublemakers, it appears that they were Jewish. Look at verse 22. Look at verse 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? It appears they were Jewish. And there was this element of people that followed Paul around, and uh, they, were, they were Jewish, and... Um, um, and they, everywhere Paul went, they came in behind him. If they could get there when Paul was there, they would come when Paul was there. But they came in behind him, and they were on a mission. And their mission was to tear everything up and to stir everything up. And uh, just look at a few verses with me. Look at Acts chapter 6. Keep your place, because we'll come back to 2 Corinthians. Look at Acts chapter 6. Now, of course, this, this first verse we're going to read is um, before um, Paul's conversion. But it's the same group of people, though. It's, it's, it's this same thought. Look at Acts chapter 6, verse 9. Then there arose certain of the synagogue. Okay, so that wasn't the New Testament church. Certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. 
and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men. Suborned means they paid them to lie in court. Okay? Then they suborned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses, against God. Now look at the next phrase, because you're going to see this phrase. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes that came upon him and caught him. And you guys know the rest of the story. Uh, they, they bring him to a trial in chapter 7. And then he gets put to death. And, and why was that? Because there were this, this element of the Jews that rejected Jesus Christ. And they, they, uh, they decided that they were going to do everything in their power to stop the movement that was promoting the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the way of salvation. And what did they do? They stirred up the people. Look at Acts 13. Acts 13. Acts 13. Acts 13. Acts 13, verse 49. And Paul is now on the scene. Paul and Barnabas are traveling together. In Acts 13, verse 49, And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. Now look at the next phrase. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. Look at chapter 14, verse 1. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, the synagogue, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and, notice, made their minds evil affected against the brethren. That was their whole goal. Look at Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. See, if the devil can't, you know, you get somebody and God's doing a work and, and you know, any, any, any good thing that's going on, you know, the Satan is going to attack. And, you know, Satan's not worried about the liberal churches, you know, he, and he's not even worried about the dead fundamental churches, really. And there's a bunch of them. He's really not worried about them. They're showing up and they're playing church and they're doing their thing and going home feeling good about themselves. And the devil's just, you know, they're just, they're just harmless. But when he finds people that are really trying to make headway in their home, in their church, and he sees, he sees a threat, and then he really begins to, to wage war. Um, you see here uh, in, these, in these verses that uh, the devil was just really, um, religion was rising up and fighting against the truth of the gospel. The, the Lord is doing something. And man, the, there is a, a, a resistance that is raised against it. Look at uh, Acts 17, verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night to Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews and these were more noble than those in Thessalonica uh, verse 12 then many of them believed <coughs> verse 13 but when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul they came thither also and what did they do they stirred up the people see if the devil can't get somebody into sin see that the devil couldn't get Paul into sin and so then what he's got to do is He's got to try to slander him. He's got to try to make him look bad. He's got to try to stir up people against him. And, um, you know, that's the way it works. Um, years ago, there was a, actually a converted Jew. His name was Hyman Appleman. And Hyman Appleman was a, one of those guys in his day. He was very well known. He preached, I think, in the early to the mid-1900s. 
and a, you know, just an amazing preacher. And, of course, there again, a converted Jew, just, just an amazing ministry. And uh, he was, um, well, uh, you know, acquainted with a lot of the other big-name guys of that time period. And um, John R. Rice, long dead now. Uh, John R. Rice was also an evangelist for many years. He had the Sword of the Lord publication, and uh, but he traveled and preached all over. And one day, John R. Rice is, is somewhere, and somebody came to him and said, did you hear about uh, Hyman Appleman? And he said, no. And he said, uh, he committed adultery with a woman. And um, you know what John R. Rice's reaction was? He immediately burst into tears, and he said, he said, oh, God. Don't let it be true. Don't let it be true. You know what happened? He was innocent. He hadn't done anything. He hadn't even remotely done anything. But just like they suborned men, they found a woman that was willing to lie for the right sum of money. And she started going around telling this tale that Hyman Appleman had slept with her and seduced her. And, well, you, you know how those stories go. I mean, that stuff spreads like wildfire. But you know what God did? Because he was innocent, God brought it all out of the woodwork. Uh, they finally caught up with that woman and confronted her. And uh, just, just it didn't take long, and God cleared Hyman Appleman. But you know, you know who did it? It was, it was, a, bunch of the, it was a bunch of the brethren that didn't like Hyman Appleman. They were probably what the Bible calls false brethren. False brethren. Um, look at Acts 21. Acts 21. You always have that fierce conflict between religion and the Holy Ghost. Um you, uh, you, you have this, this thing that goes on where um, it's, it's the natural man against the spiritual man. Um, you get these, these uh, even these preachers and these spiritual leaders, and, and, and this stuff goes on even in Baptist circles. And you, you get this stuff where a bunch of them decide that they're going to blackball a certain guy. You say, independent Baptists do that? Oh, my goodness, yes. And they'll decide they don't like somebody, and, you know, he, he's not playing by their rules, or he's, you know, he's a little different than them, and they may, but he's gaining influence. You see, God is using him. And they feel threatened by that. Or they resent that, or whatever their motive is. And so you know what they do? They, they do what people have always done. There's no new thing under the sun. And the natural man, the natural man, when you get somebody that's operating, be it a, just a regular Christian or a preacher or whatever, they, they get operating in the natural man. All of a sudden, you know, it's, 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 they, they resent, they feel jealous, they, and, and they decide, I'm going to fix this. And that's what religion does. Religion says, we can't have this. We can't have, we can't have Paul taken over. Look at all these people following him. We can't have this. Which shows you that whatever religion they had was not of God, was not of the Holy Ghost. Look at Acts 21, verse 27. Acts 21, verse 27. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him, Paul, in the temple, there it is again, look at it, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. They were always trying to stir things up. You see that in Acts chapter 15. You see it in the book of Galatians. It was sort of the same thing that was happening. And um, they wanted control. They, uh, they, they wanted religion wants to Religion is about control. Uh, you know, there, there's a God-given authority in the home, but it's an altogether different matter when you have this, this, this guy or this woman and suddenly they become abusive and they're, they're over the top and they're, they're just 
power freaks. And, uh, and some of you know, you've seen this in action. Um, and yet they come to church and, and, and they would say, well, you know, bless God, I'm, I'm allowed to do that. Well, um, you know what that is? That's, um, that's religion. That's not the Holy Ghost. Religion is about control. Religion is about making merchandise of people. And these people in Corinth, these, this undercurrent, they, um, they, they didn't like what they were seeing with Paul and this, these people loving Paul and following Paul. And so they were trying to undermine. And, and you know, that's what you, you see with our Lord. John 15, um, uh, Jesus said, uh, you know, if they persecuted me, they would persecute you also. Um, remember, the bitterest opposition to our Lord initially did not come from the Romans. Now, they got in on it, but really it wasn't from the Romans. It was the religious folks who didn't want to lose control. They didn't want to lose their grip. They didn't want to fade out of the limelight. Um, look at John 11. John 11. And, and there right here is a whole pile of verses we could look at, but we're not going to for time's sake. But John 11. You know, our Lord, from the day the Lord came on the scene, He is preaching, and I mean the book of Mark opens up, and you get down about verse 21, and it says, The people just marveled to hear Jesus because He spake, as one having authority and not as the scribes. Right away, they were hearing Jesus and they were going, man, this guy's got something. He's, he's better than, than the guys we've always listened to. And boy, that's where the trouble started. That's where it started. You get reading on down and, and it says, and there went out a fame of him. And you get a few more verses down and, and it says, and his fame went abroad. And... and um, and at one point in John 7, the, the Pharisees decided to hire some guys to, to arrest him. And the guys went to arrest him, and, uh, and it said they stood there listening to him a while, and they didn't arrest him. And the Pharisees come up to him after a while and said, why didn't you arrest him? And they said, never man spake like this man. Uh, and they, it just drove them out of their mind. But it, there's a couple verses that really put it in perspective. Look at John 11. Verse 47. So what you see happening with Paul is the same thing that happened to our Lord. And by the way, that'll happen to every true believer to some extent or another. When you're really following the Lord, there'll, there'll be somebody, because we follow in his steps. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. You know, uh, he that was born of the flesh persecuted. He that was born of the spirit, even so it is now. And every one of you is going to experience this to some degree or another as you press forward for Jesus Christ. Um, you're going you're gonna to have some people that are going to oppose you and give you a hard time and uh, really work against you. And really what will surprise you is where it comes from. Because most generally it won't be a lost person that does it. Well, at least they don't say they're lost. Look at John 11, verse 47. Then This is after Lazarus has been raised from the dead. Okay? John eleven forty seven. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. You know what they were saying? They're going to say, they were saying, man, we're going to lose our grip on these people. We're going to lose our position. We're going to be nobodies if they keep looking at Jesus. We're going to lose our power over them. There was a woman that that she, she had a husband that was a drunk. Man, this story could be told a thousand times over. And she, uh, she prayed, and she'd every time, every Wednesday night, you know, she'd come pray for my husband, pray that he'll get saved. And he was a miserable drunk, miserable, made life miserable at home. 
And boy, she had the church pray, and she prayed, and, and they had church pray, and she'd cry and weep. And, and you know what? The day came, he got saved. And he got the real thing. He got saved, and then he immediately followed the Lord in baptism. And, and next thing you know, he, he was telling all his friends about Jesus, and he was coming to visitation, and, and then he wanted to help out at church. And, and boy, he was just really getting involved. And, uh, and one of the ladies came up to her one day and said, you must be thrilled about what's going on with your husband. And she sort of went, well, sort of. And she goes, what do you mean, well, sort of? She said, well, I wanted him saved, but I didn't want him that saved. <laughs> In other words, she didn't want his salvation to get out of control. If he keeps looking at Jesus, he's going to take away my, my place. And, of course, that's a lie. We know, we know that you follow the teachings of the Lord. It would be the greatest blessing to your house it could ever be. But that's not how she saw it. She saw she was, she was going to lose her grip. She, th she thought, well, now that, now that he's a nice guy, I'll have some control. See, when he was a drunk, she didn't have any control. She thought once he got saved... She would at least have a little control, and then she realized she wasn't going to have any control. You know what it says when uh, Pilate was getting ready to put Jesus on the cross? It says, for he knew that for envy they had delivered. You know what was wrong in Corinth? Somebody wanted that loyalty that all those folks had to Paul. And somebody said, if we get him out of here, then they'll look at us. And they resented. It was envy. Um, envy is always a heart thing. Uh, the Bible says, anger is cruel and uh, wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who can stand before envy? You know, Stephen is preaching there at his trial, and he talks about how they sold Joseph, and he says his brothers sold him. It says they moved with envy. Um, in James 3, it says, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. And it says, it says this is devilish. Why would somebody want to overthrow the influence of the greatest, one of the greatest apostles that ever walked the earth that was going to give us the New Testament and, you know, uh, give us the, the, the gospel to the Gentiles and much of our New Testament? Why is that? Well, it was envy, but envy is devilish. It's devilish. Look with me at verse 16 of 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians um, 11. And at the end of the chapter, Paul launches into something. You know, he reminds them of how he had never taken a dime from them. And, and really what he's doing again is he's contrasting himself with those other guys. He said, you know, really what he's implying is those other guys can't say this. But he saves the best for last. And he comes to the end of the chapter. And look at verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In other words, he said, you can't count how many stripes I've had. In prisons more frequent, in deaths oft, of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, 
in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without that which cometh on me daily. Um, the last thing that Paul pointed to was, um, uh, again, he's contrasting himself to these others, and he points to his sufferings. He points to his sufferings. Um, you know one of the first things the Lord said about Paul? Uh, and he didn't say it to Paul. He said it to Ananias. He said, um, he, he said I'm going to show Paul how great things he must suffer for my sake. You know, the Lord in the book of John, he talked about the shepherd as opposed to the hireling. And the main contrast that the Lord, one of the main contrasts, was what the shepherd would do in danger. He said the hireling was the guy that watched the sheep, you know, and, and really all he was after was the paycheck. And, uh, and he said you could always spot the hireling because when the wolf come, or as in David's case, the bear or the lion, uh, he said the hireling would run for it. But he said the shepherd would not. The shepherd would not. He said, you know, he said, uh, he said these other guys that he said that are trying to undermine and what I'm trying to do here in Corinth and what we have done, he said they have earned nothing. He says they have proven nothing. Galatians 6, let every man prove his own work. He said really all they are is a lot of mouth. They have suffered nothing. Uh, you know, um, uh, there's an old saying, and that is when a horse is pulling its load, it's not likely to kick. You know, Paul was saying, you know, these guys that are going after me and they're, they're being critical, he said, he said, you know, it's a real indication that really they've done very little. Um, you know, people that have been through the meat grinder generally have a lot more grace for others. And um, it's the folks that tear, tear down and undermine, they usually are the meat grinder. And they are the ones that make others suffer. These guys, Paul said, can tear down. And he said, they want to they hijack. He said, they want to take what I started, Paul said. They want to hijack. Uh, they want to tell you what they don't like. But he said, but they can't build anything. And he said, that is satanic. That is satanic. I remember Brother Gip uh, talking many, many years ago, and he said uh, he remembered one time uh, seeing a, a news thing, and, and it was back in the 60s, you know, when the, when the riots and the protesters were going crazy like they have been recently. And he said they were burning down buildings. Only this time it wasn't a particular racial, racial group that was burning down the buildings. It was the hippie movement, and they were burning down buildings. And, uh, and a reporter asked one of the hippies and said, uh, so, uh, what are you guys doing, uh, you know, right now? I says, it, it looks pretty rough. And, and he says, oh, he says, we're going we're gonna to build a new society. <laughs> and, and Brother Gip said, I remember, and Brother Gip was, he's a pretty rough dude himself. And he said, I just remember looking at that going, well, he says, the lesson you learn from that is any hippie can burn down a building. <laughs> That's what you learn from that. He said, but they never build anything. Look at verse, uh, verse 30. Paul says, If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. And Paul, of course, some of you guys know in chapter 12, Paul brings the same thought up again, sort of from another angle. And he says, I glory in this. Paul is glorying. Man, he has just literally had himself beat half to death over and over and over and over and over. He suffered hardship from every angle under the sun. And, um, but you know what he's not? He's not cynical. Oh, so many believers, they get cynical. You know, when everything goes wrong and they have all this hardship and heartache and trouble and, 
And, uh, and I'm not minimizing that, but it just seems like, you know, um, yea, all that will live godly in, Je in Christ Jesus. You know, there, there's, there's going to be, uh, you know, you can't do wrong and get away with it. You can't do right and get away with it. But Paul isn't, he's not cynical. So many believers, you know, they, they sort of, uh, there's something wrong in their heart. They've lost sight of Jesus Christ and they become cynical. Paul is not cynical here. Paul has no bitter, angry words. He doesn't name the people that gave him stripes and, and he doesn't put it in princess and God's going to pay him back. And, and, you know, he doesn't do that. He says, I glory in it. Was that because he was sadistic? No, no, no. Because he realized all this was part of his journey. God told him early on, Paul, you will suffer much for my sake. I wonder if that's why at the end of the road, he said, I have finished my course. I, I wonder if his heart was just exploding with joy and relief. Man, I made it. Finished. He wasn't cynical. He was glorying. He wasn't whining. He wasn't nursing his wounds. He was rejoicing. Those early believers, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. He knew he had God's stamp of approval. He wasn't suffering because he'd been stupid. He wasn't suffering because he'd hurt somebody. He wasn't suffering because he'd lost his temper somewhere. He said, I bear in my body the marks. You know what Richard Wormbrand did? He was standing before the, uh, the, one of the U.S. Congress subcommittees, and, and he was giving testimony about all his sufferings there in, uh, in, in Russia, in the prison camps, Those, that 12 or 14 years he was there in prison. And one of the guys had the gall to say, and it's a huge gathering, and it's being written in the public record. And one of them says, well, we, we hear everything you're saying, but how do we know what you're telling us is true? And he paused a minute, and he pulled off his shirt and turned around. And his shirt, his skin had huge, massive scars all over it. That was proof enough. Paul, are you whining? We talk about scars, and and and, and bunch of you, you've got them, and 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 you know they're not all they're not all on your skin. But Paul said, you know, he says I've got a lot of scars, and he says, but I've got some for Jesus. And he said, I glory in those. Paul would accept the hard road. He would accept the hard road. You know why so many believers, um, you know why so many believers really don't really don't get anywhere. You know they sort of get stuck somewhere. It's because they get a little taste of the hard road and they look at the Lord and say, Lord, um, if this is the road, I think I'm going to take a different one. You know, it's hard where they are. You know, sometimes Christians, they get stuck in positions where if you're going to stay right with God, you're stuck. If you're going to stay right with God, there's, you know, there's, if you're going to, you know, you can get out, you can escape, you can get out of where you are, but you can't get out of where you are and be right with God. And they're faced with a choice. Lord, if I'm going to stay right with you, I'm going to keep taking a beat where I'm at. And the Lord says, Paul would accept the hard road. He would take God's path. And he would still press on. And he would still keep building. And he would still keep following. I close with an illustration. Uh, I knew a guy. He's, he's dead now. I knew a guy that trained soldiers. He was a drill instructor in World War II. And he trained uh, Filipino uh, soldiers for a time. And so he was in the Philippines 
And uh, the Philippines is tropical, and it's really, really, you know, you can imagine uh, super hot. I've never been in a tropical place. The furthest, the closest I've ever been was Houston, Texas. And, and I remember one day we, we decided to go for a walk, and it was 118 degrees Fahrenheit. And I thought, you know, I don't think I'm going to go for a walk today. And, uh, and I remember how miserable it was. You know, you know the good news about that? I wasn't a soldier. I didn't have a drill instructor saying, March. You say, oh, they don't do that at 180 degrees. Oh, you don't understand being a soldier. Marco, who you, you know, Marco and uh, Andrea that came here for a little while, he's from Croatia and she's from Serbia. And uh, he talked about, he joined the French Foreign Legion. I want to get back to my story about the Filipino because I'm going to get sidetracked here. And then we're done. Marco wanted to escape the communist country he was in. So he decided he would swim the Black Sea. Oh, they're a wonderful place to live. Mm -hmm. That's pretty desperate if you want to swim the Black Sea. He got in really good shape, and one day he swam the Black Sea. He swam for hours. A patrol boat stopped him and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm training for the Olympics, and they let him go. He landed on the shores of France as a young man. And he went and joined the French Foreign Legion. He said, when you sign up for the French Foreign Legion, he said, they have one question. The French Foreign Legion is an elite special forces group. They're an elite fight. They're a mercenary fighting force. And they're an elite fighting force. And when you join the French Foreign Legion, they have one question for you. As you're about to sign, they look at you and they say, are you sure you want to do this? That's the only question they ask. And when you say, I'm sure, he said, we train six months out of every year. We were six months training and six months on missions. And he said, I'm talking about the heat. And he said, I remember there was a, there was a boy from uh, Norway one, or one of those Scandinavian countries, tall, blonde, fair-skinned. And he said, we were on a blistering, terrible stint of training. And he said, he had a heat stroke. And I said, I said, so what does that mean? Do you, do you, does he recover and come back in? He said, oh, no. He said, when you have a heat stroke, he said, a real live heat stroke, he said, you're never the same after that. He said, he was done. He was done. I'm talking about the heat. This guy was in the Philippines, and he was trained in soldiers. He was training Filipinos. He said, we were cutting bamboo. And he said, bamboo is itchy. And he said, it was thick. And he said, the heat was unbelievable. And he said, there was a big, big, uh, big container of water on the edge of the clearing. And he said, I had my guys. And he said, I, told, I said, OK, guys, you know what I do, you do. And he said, I grabbed the machete. And he said, we're cutting through the bamboo. And he said, I kept seeing these little Filipinos. I'd see one sneak over the water thing. And I'd, he said, I saw two or three of them do it. And I stopped. And he said, OK, line up. So they all lined up, and he said, I looked at him and said, okay, guys, if any more of you sneak over to the water tank, he said, I'm dumping the water. And, you know, they, they probably thought he was bluffing. I'm not sure what they thought. But he said, he said but I was going to do what I said. He said, sure as a world. About a half hour later, I saw one of them sneaking over the water. He said, I lined him up again. He said, I took the lid off the water and I kicked it over. And he said, they gasp. And he said, I looked at him again and I said, okay, guys, what I can do, you can do. And he said, for hours with no water, he said, I worked them half to death. And he said, me too. You know what Paul did? Paul, he took the hard road. Now, the Lord is good, and his yoke is easy, and his burden is light. But, you know, along the way, sometimes there's some hard pills to swallow. I heard Brother Gipp say this one time. He said, some days, he said, every once in a while, you'll come to a place where you have to forgive your commander-in-chief. He said, God will make a call, and you'll be going, God, what are you doing? And he said, you'll never understand. But he said, you'll either do what Paul did or you'll walk away. Paul said, 
I will glory in my infirmities. And you know what he said to the Corinthians? He said, follow me as I follow Christ. God's been good to us. You know, a lot of our, a lot of our battles and a lot of our stuff is, uh, I'm not going to minimize it. I'm not going to say it's small because a lot of it is not. You know, and, um, but, but the Lord said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And his call is the same as Paul's. Follow me. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Paul. Thank you for the example. And Lord, every man that follows you has opposition. Every woman that follows you has opposition. Lord, there's satanic opposition. There's people opposition. There's family opposition. And Lord, there's stripes and there's beatings and there's trouble. But Lord, I pray, Lord, that you'd help us all. Lord, that we keep our eyes on you. And Lord, we would learn to rejoice and realize, Lord, that our suffering, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And Lord, you'd help us to be looking at that other world and help us, Lord, to keep trust in you. And God, help us not to be sidetracked or bittered by false brethren. Lord, help us just to keep going on for you. In Jesus' name. I'm going to give you just a minute to talk to the Lord.